When I went to the Sword Conference in 1961 and heard a soul winning lecture by Dr. Jack Howell that I'm going to share with you in part tomorrow, plus some other things, I sat on a pew on that side of Antioch Baptist Church toward the back, and my heart seemed like it was swelling. And I said, <sighs> I breathed. <sighs> about to die. I thought, this is the clearest presentation of the gospel I've ever heard. This fellow ought to be on nationwide television doing nothing except telling folks how to get saved. I was so excited. <sighs> but I had a little country church. Maybe we'll take a tour and show it to you. A little white frame building over here. My church was paying me $75 a month, not a week, a month. My house note for $95.20 a month. It took $20.20 a month on top of what they gave me to pay my house note. That's not counting food and light bill and power bill and everything else. But I sat back there and breathed. Dr. Jack Howe said, There's not a great soul winning church in Atlanta, Georgia, like the Highland Park Baptist Church in Chattanooga. He said, Why isn't there a church in Atlanta like the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Pontiac, Michigan? Where's the church in Atlanta where people walk the aisle every Sunday and souls are saved? Every Sunday, every Sunday, every Wednesday night. Where's the church like that? And he preached. My whole heart said, I said, Lord, I'm, I'm just a mailman. I can't sit around for one. You know me, Lord. You know, I got a little country church over there. I never have preached a sermon yet. I've been over hollering at them five years, but they, don't, they still don't know nothing. I know they didn't come to hear me preach back in those days. They came to watch me. <laughs> I didn't say anything back in those days. There was a little picket fence across the front of the pulpit area up here, about, about that high, a little bit post in it. And I used to get excited. I'd get to hollering and screaming, you know, and telling about a cat that died or something else, you know. And I'd walk that little rail back and forth like that. And crowds came out to hear me preach, but they wanted to be there when I fell off that rail. <laughs> I said, Lord, I don't even know how to tell folks how to get saved. They didn't even know how I myself till the day. Dr. Howell's lecture on was sitting back there when he said, Why doesn't somebody do it? I said it in my heart, but I didn't say it out loud. I said, Dr. Howells, if I live long enough, and you live long enough, you're going to come back at Atlanta, and you're going to preach in a soul-winning church, and I'm going to be the pastor of it. And I mean it. And I left there. In two weeks' time, I turned in my resignation, and Mr. Broach, who was in the mails with the indicator, said, You are crazy. He said, We'll hold your job for you. He died last year. I don't, I don't guess they hold it any longer now. He's dead. <laughs> but they held it 13 years for me up there. But I never went back. I never intended to go back. I gave the post office a permanent wave. And God blessed, and I saw that tiny little church go to over 8,000 members, become the largest church in the state of Georgia. And in 1972, the fastest growing church in America, we increased our attendance 1972, 846 over the 1971 average. We, dropped, we jumped from 1,200 and something to over 2,000 and, be, and became the 12th largest church in America that year. All began with that little soul winning thing. But you, you witness those tracks all the time. It's so easy to do. I mean, you, just like that, you, you can lead 20 people to Christ on the way home. With that little track, they're all gone. <laughs> all I have what's in my pocket. But with that little track, you can lead them to Christ. I do it all the time. I like this track better than any track for two reasons. Number one, it's very simple and clear. It leads to a decision at the end. And number two is it's very attractive. It's very neat. If you give out a, a, a crummy-looking track, people look at it and say, I'm a bunch of Christians. A few years back, nearly three years ago now, I was driving around 285 Expressway, and I passed the airport, and I saw some big planes taking off. And before I knew it, I said something. I said, Dear Lord, since I got my heart stirred up in the sword conference and heard Dr. Rice and Dr. Howes, Dr. Tom Malone in that sword conference, I said, I'd like to get on that one of those planes one of these days and go fly and fly out and go speak in the conference with Dr. Rice and Dr. Howes in the sword conference. And I drove on down the expressway a little bit and I talked to myself. I said, Self. And I said back to myself, What do you want? And then I said, You're a nut. If anybody heard you pray that, You'd be embarrassed. Don't ever tell anybody that. And I said, yeah, that was sort of silly. Don't know what it made me think I ought to preach in the sword comes, Dr. Rice, not the house. But 
I rolled on a few minutes, and then I looked back up to the Lord, and I said, but I meant it, and you know I meant it. When I got back to my office, there was a long-distance call from Dr. Walter Hanford, Greenville, South Carolina. I returned the call. He said, Curtis, would you come speak in our SWORD conference this year? He had called before I called. God wanted me to speak in that SWORD conference. He already had it all lined up, but he wanted me to ask for it. I bought my boy an Appaloosa horse two or three Christmases ago. I bought and paid for it before he ever saw it. But I took him out to the pasture. I said, son, I'm going to buy you a horse for Christmas. I said, now, there's six horses out there, five or six. I said, you pick out any horse you want. Now, I'd already bought and paid for one of them. There's one of them he's going to get. You say, you're taking a big chance. No, I know my boy. And I know how to lead him to ask for what I want him to have. So I just stood there. He'd say, well, what do you think about that? You, Tony. He kept asking questions. We kept batting back and forth. So I led him around to ask for the bare horse I had already bought and paid for. And he loves her. Her name's Star. He loves her. I think God had already had me lined up speaking at that Ford conference. He just took me around the expressway to show me them airplanes. And when he saw the airplane, he said, hey, when you like to get on? I said, yeah, I'd like to ride on that. <laughs> he already bought and paid for it and had it lined up, see. I, uh, I use the same kind of deodorant. I've used the same kind for 20 years. I use fresh cream deodorant. I was hoping a while ago Dr. Hudson would start using fresh cream deodorant. But I use... I use fresh cream deodorant. <laughs> now, uh, you buy me Ice Blue Secret, I won't touch it. I won't use Right Guard. I won't use Mum. I won't use Arid. I use fresh cream deodorant. Now you're some of the house. Why don't you try something else? You might like it. I might and I might not, but I know I like fresh cream deodorant.
Hello, everyone. I'm Ari Povich. Welcome to A Current Affair. The First Baptist Church in Hammond, Indiana, is a multi-million dollar operation. The Hammond, Indiana Church boasts of having the largest congregation in the country. One thing they're not proud of, however, is the battle between their pastor and one of the parishioners. Our John Johnston tells us the pastor is accused of having an affair with the church member's wife and keeping the same man locked away in the basement, praying for an end to all the sins he saw around him. And joins us now with another special report called Praying from the Pulpit. Yes. Rich, the North Sharon Baptist Church and half a dozen other fundamentalist churches in southeast Michigan subscribe to the views of Hammond, Indiana preacher Jack Hiles. North Sharon is one of seven Hiles doctrine churches around the country identified as having faced child molesting scandals. Hiles' own First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana is one of them. Last March, church deacon A.V. Ballinger was convicted on charges he molested a seven-year-old girl in Sunday school. Not only has Hiles defended Ballinger from the pulpit, he's said Christians shouldn't settle such matters in heathen courts. A.B. Ballinger should not be judged in the courts of Hammond. He should be judged by wise people in the First Baptist Church of Hammond, if he's judged at all. Now tonight, for years, Jack Hiles has preached he's always for the accused, never for the accuser. Hiles says he won't listen to malicious gossip. His critics say it's a recipe for cover-up, which permits denial of scandals like child molesting. We're not supposed to go to court in the Bible, black and white, Hiles and his followers have done more than defend their deacon. Hiles' son-in-law suggested in a sermon that on one occasion, the seven-year-old victim came on to him. The little seven-year-old girl who supposedly accused A.V. Ballinger rode my bus route for a year. First time I met her, she jumped in my arms, affectionately hugged on me. I had to have the bus captain, a co-captain, pry her arms off of my neck. Most affectionate, loving, kissing, hugging girls I've ever met.
Now this is my old buddy here, old friend, Dr. Jack Treber, always a great encouragement. He has me out to, for his place to preach and he does it because I'm old and broken down yes. and he just wants to encourage me and I return the favor of these old broken down uh, hobbling around preachers, you know. Listen, you did a great job preaching this evening, the message on revival and uh, people are, people have moved really because we know this is Dr. David Gibbs, he needs no introduction, of course. But anyway, he's here preaching at this Baptist Friends meeting and has done an outstanding job, as expected. I don't know why we just get to thinking that these folks are going to preach and going to get the job done. But... Dr. Curtis Sudson said to, gave the best compliment to First Baptist Church of Hammond to have been given in the sword of the Lord this week. He said, he was here for pastor school. <laughs> he told him the conversion and baptism we had that Sunday before. And he said, if God were writing the book of Acts today, he'd write about the First Baptist Church of Hammond. Well, that's, that's the ultimate compliment. <laughs> 